Matthew chapter 16. And we're just going to read the first four verses to begin with. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4. The gospel according to Matthew 16, 1 through 4. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now this is as the great New York area sports personality Yogi Berra once said, deja vu all over again. I mean, we've seen this before, haven't we? That they're coming and asking the Lord for a sign. And the Lord has already given ample evidence, in fact, more than enough evidence, but they're refusing to believe it. And that's why the Lord is going to dub them a wicked and adulterous generation. Wicked in that they don't want to submit to God, and adulterous in that their hearts are unfaithful to God. Now, think of the many times in the Old Testament that the prophets, like Hosea, for example, would use that figure of whoredom and harlotry and adultery in a spiritual way. It often went hand in hand, of course, with literal physical immorality. But so often the prophets, when they're talking about the adultery of Israel, they're talking about how they went after other gods. Other things took the place in their heart and mind that should have belonged to the one true God only. And they would have been, I'm sure, aghast. They didn't look at themselves this way. They thought they were the ones who were loyal to God. One of the older names for the Pharisees, for example, was the Hasidim. Now, you recognize that word from the term we use today, Hasidic Jews. It means upright ones. And they would have thought we were the ones because they have their roots in the time of the Maccabees in the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. They were the ones who remained loyal to God. That's what they thought. They remained loyal to the Bible and loyal to the traditions of the fathers. And in a sense, their ancestors had remained loyal at a critical juncture when this uh, wicked king Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to stamp out Judaism. They held on to the ancestral faith and they fought to preserve their religion, and eventually to gain a measure of independence. But by the time of the Lord Jesus' day, it, of course, had devolved, as we've seen, into putting traditions in the place of God's word. And whenever people start out, whether it's in Judaism or Christendom, people start out putting tradition alongside scripture. And they say, oh, of course, the Bible is the main thing. Beware. Because when push comes to shove, it's often the scripture that gets set aside and the tradition is upheld. And there's a big push in certain circles with the onset again of Reformed theology, the so-called New Calvinist movement. We have a lot of people putting out books today that are saying we need to go back to the confessions and to the creeds. We need to go back to liturgy that has been in the history of the church. And it's not to say that everything in these confessions and creeds was bad. Many of them are accurately conveying what the scripture taught, but they have to be looked at like commentaries. A commentary can be helpful and encouraging. It can make you sort of go back and check yourself. Am I really reading the scripture correctly? But you don't trust the commentary as the ultimate source. You trust the word as the source. And with this emphasis on creeds and confessions and liturgies and the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Heidelberg Catechism, Martin Luther's catechisms and so forth, and the Westminster Longer and Shorter Catechisms. These things are being brought back in evangelical circles, and it's not good. 
It's ultimately going to weaken people's hold on the scripture, not strengthen people's hold on the scripture. And we've seen it in the history of the church. We see it in the history of the Jews of our Lord's day. Now, this section, as we've been noting, going back to chapter 14, has been all about this question of whose son is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen that he's the son of God. We've seen his deity displayed. And over and over, there have been things that the Lord has done that show us his godliness, the fact that he represents his father. And there's a light motif, as they say in literature, a kind of a minor theme running through these chapters of bread and eating. So you get Herod, who has his feast. And of course, that's in contrast to how the Lord Jesus is. Herod's feast is one that is governed by unbelief and lust and ultimately terrible crimes committed. Whereas the Lord Jesus feeds the 5,000 in the next story in chapter 14. And he supplies and comforts and ministers to those who are weak. And they leave his presence complete and contented, satisfied. Of course, later there's the story of the Syrophoenician woman. It's okay, we'll get it later. Yeah, we'll get it later. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Anyway, no pasa nada, as the phrase goes. Anyway, so the Syrophoenician woman comes to the Lord, and you remember in that interchange, she wants the Lord to heal her, and as we saw, the Lord is saying, look, I've been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So she, in Ephesians 2 language, was without the covenants, without the promises of God, without God in the world. But she takes that place, that lowly place, and says, yes, Lord, I'm a dog. <laughs> All right, call me a dog. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And the Lord acts on that because whenever a sinner takes their place and says, Lord, I have nothing, you have everything. Amen. The Lord's not going to turn them away. Amen. As he says in John 6, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Now. We see again that motif of eating in chapter 15, when the Lord again feeds the 4,000. And when we come to chapter 16, again, we get the bread, you know, manner of speaking that is mentioned here, because verse 5 tells us the disciples, when they came to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And this passage is all about perspective, isn't it? How you look at things. Because the Lord starts out with the wicked and adulterous generation. And he says, you know, you can go out and you can look at the sky and you can do your little homespun meteorology. You know the old saying, my grandpa taught it to me, red at night, sailors delight. Red in morning, sailors take warning. That's kind of what this is saying here. You can look at the sky and you can determine tomorrow it's going to be a nice day or tomorrow it's going to be a rainy day or whatever. You can look around and you can obviously see signs physically and perceive the physical consequences of those signs, what they're portending, what they speak of. But when it came to the spiritual signs that the Lord Jesus was doing, they were utterly blind to that. And so again, the Lord, just as he had in chapter 12, reiterates that no sign shall be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And we remember, as Henry told us, that the sign of the prophet Jonah, it's a simulated death and resurrection in a sense, but it's particularly to the Gentiles, and not any Gentiles, the worst of the worst Gentiles, the Ninevites, which is like ground central for all the wickedness that was happening in the Assyrian Empire. And yet, through that sign, that city repented and was spared. And here's another city, supposed to be the city of the great king. Here's a nation that's supposed to be the people of the Lord. They have the covenants. They have the promises. They have the word of God, the oracles of God, as scripture calls it. Uh, they have all these things, and yet they've not perceived what the sign means. Mm -hmm. Now, that, of course, is true of unbelievers. But when we come again to this matter of bread, we find out the disciples, although they are believers, Believers are capable of missing 
what they're seeing too, right? Like we can see things and not draw the right conclusion. So the Lord says to them in verse six, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now leaven, what we call yeast today, you put it in dough and it permeates the dough and it makes the dough rise. Okay, That's in the process of making bread. If you really want to know about the process, you can hail my wife, Naomi. She does it on a regular basis at home. So she can tell you all about bread making. She's forgotten more about it than I'll ever know. I am an authority on eating bread, on the other hand. So that, <laughs> the Lord here obviously is speaking metaphorically, and we've already seen him use leaven metaphorically in the parable of the leaven and the meal in Matthew 13 that we briefly considered yesterday. And here he's warning them, leaven and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, as far as I can tell in the Bible, leaven is always negative. And it speaks of evil. It's one of two types of evil. It can be moral evil. In other words, immorality. And you get that in 1 Corinthians 5. When he's talking about the man who has his father's wife there, who's living in adultery, living in an incestuous situation, that he needs to be put out. Because it's said, quoting the Old Testament, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he goes back to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and says, you know, symbolically, this is what we're to eat. We're to, we were saved to be holy. So Passover speaks of our redemption in Christ. The next feast connected to it, really, they were conjoined. Passover was the 14th of Nisan. Unleavened Bread, which was a seven-day feast, began on the 15th of Nisan. So they started eating unleavened bread, by the way, during the Passover. And that unleavened bread feast pictured the ongoing state of a holy life, that the Lord has bought us with a price, and we're not our own, as we'll say in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, that we're now to live differently. We're to glorify God in our body, not give our body to fornication, not join it to a harlot. And so sometimes leaven is immorality. But here, he's not speaking about immorality in the sense of sexual um, sin and that sort of thing. But here, it's obviously doctrine. And that's what he tells them in verse 12. There's this explanatory statement. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And Brother Henry referred to that yesterday. I think you know well that Pharisees were the theological conservatives, uh, Sadducees were the theological liberals, and we have those people with us today. The people that on the one hand add to the word of God and bring man's tradition in so strongly that the word of God is subsumed or obscured. And then we have the Sadducee inside, the liberality that says, oh, because of the modern world, because of modern science, because of the progress of philosophy, we can't believe all the myths of the Bible anymore. So they're taking scripture away. And we know the scripture tells us not to add to it, nor to take away from it. It's very serious to cling to the word of God. And the Lord is warning them of these extremes. Because after all, we are people that tend to go to extremes. We go to the left or to the right. And the Lord is really in joining us to the middle path of truth, that path that goes forth following him. Now, there's perspective then. You can look at the sky and you can miss what the sky is telling you. You can look at the miracles of the Lord Jesus and miss what they're pointing to. You could even be a disciple and mistake what the Lord is talking about if you don't come to the words of the Lord Jesus with a spiritual mindset. If you're not coming saying, Lord, open my eyes to what you're saying in the scripture. If you're not dependent on the Lord by his spirit. First Corinthians 2 tells us these things are spiritually ascertained. The Lord told us that when the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit whom he would send would come, he said to the apostles, he will guide you into all truth. But the principle is the same for us. We need the Holy Spirit to take this word and to open it up to us. Because I can tell you from experience, both in personal study and in studying academically, studying the Bible 
in a setting where I was studying archaeology. I had a professor that was a world-renowned archaeologist. He actually found the oldest piece of scripture they've ever discovered. He was a man that knew six modern languages. He knew several more ancient languages fluently. And he knew the Bible backwards and forwards. When I say he knew the Bible backwards and forwards, he knew the Hebrew Bible like that, the Old Testament. But he also knew the New Testament. He knew it in Greek and he knew it in English. And yet he didn't believe in the God of the Bible. He was an agnostic. So he could tell you about the history and the culture and the geography and the physical setting of the land, but he didn't know the author of the book. And so he was blind. You know, I gladly gleaned from him archaeological information and historical information and cultural and linguistic information. But there I had to leave it because he couldn't tell me anything about the Lord. Couldn't tell me anything about eternal life. And we can fall into that trap too, where we're just studying the Bible. And as much as we love to see patterns and structure and theme and follow the thought flow, if we don't let that lead us to the Lord, we're no better than the ones that I read to you of in John 5, 39, where he says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which speak of me. But they hadn't seen the Lord in the scripture because they, in their will, did not want to come to him, did not want to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful of our perspective. Now, speaking of perspective, look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And there the Lord uses one of his favorite titles, a messianic title from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And he wants to know, who are people saying that I am? So he comes to this place, Caesarea Philippi, as we mentioned earlier in the week, that is synonymous with idolatry. The same way that if I say Atlantic City, you think casino, or maybe Lucy the Elephant. But anyway, it depends how sanctified you are, you know? Uh, certain cities evoke certain things, right? Miami, South Beach, you know, something like that. Where our mind immediately goes somewhere. You think Caesarea Philippi? They would have thought, oh, that's where a lot of Gentiles have put shrines. And Brother Henry and I have been there a number of years <laughs> back on a trip. And uh, long story there, but I'll let Henry tell you privately mm -hmm. about our experience there. But anyway, think of this area where all these idolatrous shrines were. What is an idol but man's idea of what God is like? It's a false idea, of course. It is a diminishing of the glory of God. That's why man was prohibited from making graven images, right? Because we don't have the capacity to remake anything that is remotely like God, remotely approaching his glory. So he's in a place that is synonymous with man's ideas of what God is like, man's perspective on God. And this is where he asks, what do, who do men say that I am? Now, the disciples are not idolaters. They're believers in the true and living God of Israel. So they're not going to say, oh, you're like Zeus, or you're like Apollo, or you're like Baal. They say, some say John the Baptist, verse 14, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, if you say that to me, or if I compared one of you to one of them, you say, oh, that's highly complimentary. I don't know if I'd get out the door, my head would be so swollen, you know. But to the Lord, it falls so far short, right? right. As Paul would later say in 1 Corinthians, what is Paul and what is Apollos, but servants by whom you believe? It's Christ. We preach Christ and him crucified. That's the thing. We sing sometimes. Nothing but Christ, the Christ of God. Uh, the Bible teacher of a bygone generation, Samuel Rideout, when he died, they put out a commemorative booklet about his life. And I love the title. It says, None of Self, Christ is All. Christ is All. That's right. We don't look to these men of the past as much as we admire them, as much as we want to imitate them as they imitated Christ. It's the Lord is the ultimate object of our faith, right? And so then the Lord says to them, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? <clears throat> Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Now, this is really the high point of this whole section of who the Lord Jesus is, other than the fact that on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Lord is going to reaffirm that this is his son, his beloved one, and they need to hear him. But notice Peter's words here. You are the Christ. So he's acknowledging the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus. But he calls him the Son of God. No, not just the Son of God. The Maybe. adjective there. Amen. The Son of the living God. In this area where there are so many dead gods, idols, images, icons, shrines, Caesarea Philippi. This is where Simon Peter says, in essence, Lord, you're not like those. You're the son of the living God, the God who acts, the God who does, the God who's real. And the Lord pronounces a beatitude on him in verse 17. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So this is not a naturally derived insight from Peter's superior intellect. This is not even a tremendous flash of inspiration that struck this uh, humble fisherman from Galilee. This is something that God has directly revealed to him. In other words, this perspective that Jesus is the son of the living God, it's coming from heaven. And he goes on to talk about the ramifications of that confession. And for the first time in the New Testament, he'll mention the church. But I'm going to leave that for Henry to talk about. Whoa. The remarkable thing. Wow. I'm leaving it for you to talk about. Anyway, I hear you. I'm not going to trample all the pastors. <laughs> but the amazing thing to me is that after that, in this first place where he talks about the future church, we know that later Paul is going to tell the elders from Ephesus in Acts 20 when he meets them at Miletus, he's going to refer to the church and he's going to say, which he purchased with blood of his own. God purchased the church with his son's own blood. So think of the tremendous cost that this church is not created like the first creation. The first creation came by the verbal fiat of God. In other words, God said it and it came into being. I'm not saying God didn't exert a tremendous amount of energy in creating it. But by doing that, God wasn't diminished in the slightest. God wasn't tired. God didn't rest the seventh day because it was so exhausting making the heavens and the earth. Far from it. But think of what it cost him to make the new creation, beginning with the church, which is a harbinger of things to come, a picture <coughs> in this world of what the new heavens and the new earth are going to be. It cost the Lord his own life. His own son had to come. And Romans 8 reminds us, he who spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? So he begins to show them from that time how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, as they get closer to Jerusalem, you find out the thinking, the perspective of the disciples is that Everything's going to go from strength to strength, that the glory is increasing, the kingdom is nearer, and the Lord Jesus is going up to Jerusalem and is going to establish the kingdom, and what job am I going to have in the kingdom? You know, it's like when a president-elect is picking out his cabinet, and people are saying, I'm sure <laughs> among a certain coterie of people, they're wondering, am I, am I in the running for secretary of state? Am I in the running for secretary of treasury? or whatever it is, and they're wondering, you know, are there, am I going to get the call to be that person? And the disciples are thinking like that. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? But the Lord, in talking about the church, says, no, I'm not going up there to establish my kingdom forcibly and to rule and reign now, yeah. as we've heard repeatedly yeah. in this week. Amen. It's the cross and then the crown. Amen. It's the suffering and then the glory. And so the Lord tells them candidly about that. And he's going to go on and tell them at least three more times about that prior, <clears throat> excuse me, to going up to the cross. But look at Peter's reaction in verse 22. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Now that sentence is wrong on so many levels. 
I mean, how do you say to the Lord, not so? How do you say, far be it from you? After you, you say you're you, the son of you, Yeah, God. after you say you're the son of the living God. And this shows us the fickle nature of humanity, that even people that are saved, even people that are born again, mm -hmm. that they can one minute be talking about the most sublime, beautiful truths regarding the Lord. And they're getting that from heaven. They're getting that from the word of God. And a few minutes later, they can come up with something that's totally fleshly in the sense that it's man's thinking. It's of this world. It's for this age. And this is the battle we face. This is why we have to be so careful to come to the Lord. Our brother used the scripture the other day from Romans 12, 2, that we need to be transformed Amen. by the renewing of Amen. our minds. And we need that renewing on a daily basis from the word of God, letting the Lord basically <coughs> strain out, <coughs> pardon me, strain out the rubbish that we hear all the time in the world, and even what our own flesh can put into our mind, and even the wiles of the devil. We need to wash these things away by the word of God. So Peter goes from speaking with the Father's words <clears throat> to speaking Satan's words. And Satan here, again, it's characteristic, the title that's used in verse 23. Satan means the adversary. So it was originally a legal term, like the prosecuting attorney, the one who accuses the prisoner in the dock, you know, the person that's on trial and here peter isn't standing with the lord supporting what the father says by saying you're not going to go to the cross by saying you're not going to suffer and die he's actually uttered something that is not only erroneous it's satanic yep. if you follow through that mentality it subverts the entire gospel and the truth of god's word and so he says you're an offense to me for you're not mindful of the things of god but the things of men. Paraphrasing, you're not thinking godly thoughts from the scripture now, Peter. You're thinking like a mere fallen man. And so you don't want to do that. Now, the Lord goes on to make a call for discipleship, but if one's going to lose everything and follow Christ, if we're going to deny ourselves and take up our cross, there's a cost there. How do we know it's worth it? Amen. Later, Peter's Amen. going to ask the Lord in chapter 19, behold, we have left all to follow you. What shall we have mm -hmm. in the kingdom? And it's a legitimate question. Is it really worth it to give up the world? Can we say, take the world, but give me Jesus? I mean, is that a good trade? And the Lord tells him, yes, verse 28, assuredly, I say to you, there's some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. And I believe that what we see next in chapter 17 is the fulfillment of the Lord's words. That six days later, he takes Peter, James, and John and leads them up into a high mountain. And verse two of 17 says, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. So what are they getting? They're getting a kingdom preview. They're getting a preview, not now of the meek and lowly Jesus as he was at his first coming, but they're seeing the transcendent Lord of glory. Even though he hasn't yet died, even though he hasn't yet been raised from the dead, even though he hasn't yet ascended into glory and received all the accolades and honors that he would, and from our perspective that he has now entered into, dwelling in light which no man can approach to, in a sense, uh, we can't see that now, but they got a little preview of it in that day. And it was so great that Peter couldn't stop thinking about it. Decades later in 2 Peter 1, he would refer back to when they beheld the most excellent glory in the mount. And they heard the voice of the Father saying in verse 5 here, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So at the beginning of his public ministry at the baptism in chapter three, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
Now, after the Lord has been preaching and teaching and healing and going about doing good to all the people, as Peter would later describe it in the book of Acts, God says about him, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I've not changed my opinion one bit. I've not moved. In fact, if anything, there was more to show the pleasure that God had in him. There was more display to human beings, that is, of how much God loved his son by what the son had been doing or what the father had been doing through. And here, in contrast to Elijah and Moses, as great as those men were, the greatest of the prophetic age, maybe, Elijah, and the greatest of the age of law, <coughs> Moses, the lawgiver, and the prophet who denounced apostasy and called the people back to the true and living God. And he says, as great as they are, you're not building them any tabernacles. Hear him. Hear my son. And so when we get caught up with some gifted servant of God, some great figure in church history, ancient or modern, maybe somebody contemporary to us even, we need to step back and remember, no, this is just a servant. We value them for what the Lord does through them. But the one we need to revere and venerate and honor is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to hear him above anyone else. Servants are only of value insofar as they do the will of their master. And preachers are only of value insofar as they accurately speak forth the word of God. So that's a little overview. I turn it over to Henry. There's more there, of course. And Brother Henry can feel free to share. And if you want to go into 18 and there's still time, feel free to do that. But I doubt you will. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we're back in Matthew 16. And uh, as we've seen and heard, this is the first time that someone on this planet, and again, back to Peter, the most often mentioned apostle in this section, his name is Little Stone, remember? And when you come into uh, John's gospel, uh, and there, uh, his name is changed. And Peter now becomes uh, symbolic of a living stone. Okay? And so the Lord Jesus is the living stone, and we are made little living stones. And so in his own uh, epistle, Peter's going to talk about that, how we are living stones, aren't we? Built up and so on. So this is yeah, 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 but the name Peter is, is, is a small stone. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a Petra. But Peter is living stone. That's exactly right. But I'm saying he who is the, the Petra, the, the little stone, Right, and made such by the living stone himself, the rock. Uh, now we are living stones built up by him to make him a habitation of God through the spirit. See? So this is Peter, and, and Peter at this juncture uh, is the first man on planet Earth in response to the Lord's question who do men say that I am? Or in other words, what does the world say? Who does the world say that I am? And what sets us apart from the world and makes us living stones? Our confession that he is the son of God, the son of the living God. And so at that point, the uh, you have that that is the bedrock upon which the church is <clears throat> built. And that is consistent with Pauline teaching later in Ephesians and so on. And so now Jesus answered unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. And now we're again back to the issue of means and what we have here on earth and where the life of the church comes, where the sustenance of the church comes, the power of the church comes, the revelation to the church comes, the life of the church comes. It comes from no earthly source whatsoever, but it comes directly from 
the Father which is in heaven. And so you have right from the get-go uh, the Pauline teaching of Ephesians 3, the heavenly calling of the church. And at this place, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but there's the importance of the transfiguration, which will follow in chapter 17, which is, again, to realize that the church's existence, everything that is supplied to the church, Everything that the church has and is to function in is the reality of the living God in glory and Jesus Christ, our head himself, glorified at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, so blessed art thou because flesh and blood did not reveal this unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And then now comes another revelation. And this revelation now doesn't come from the Father, but comes from the Son himself. And that is important as well, because in verse 18, he says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? Well, not Peter, but the rock of the confession that he is the Son of the living God. And that specifically separates not only us from all mankind and makes us the ecclesia, the called out. We've been called out, Peter's terminology, to glory and virtue. Where? At the right hand of the majesty on high. This is what separates us from all mankind and not only separates us from all mankind, but distinguishes the church from Israel. It is the church that is responsible to witness to the truth on this planet that Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, and rose again, according to the scriptures, is coming again in great power and glory, and that he that Israel rejected is none other than the son of the living God. And so now um, I say unto thee that upon this rock and I will build my church. Who's the builder of the church? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the son over the father's house. He is the builder. He's not just a servant. It's his house. And he's the builder of it. See? And so Hebrews 3, he's the one that is greatest of all. The importance of the church never losing the sight and the character of her foundation, who builds her, and who it is who builds her. So now at this point, um, we're going to get this issue of, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And so again, an emphasis that, and what that means is what the church binds on earth has already been bound in heaven. It's not that the church binds something and then heaven acts. It's the other way around. We're linked to the Lord Jesus at the right hand of God. We're led by him from there. And when we act, all that we do, all that we say should be the expression of that which is the will of heaven. Not for men to lead it, not for men to govern it in and of themselves, you see. But again, to point every member, the whole church, always to the person of the builder who is the head and the bedrock upon which the church is built. And now at this point, this is a very important question that has to follow. And if you're sitting there and you're Peter and you put yourself in that point and this revelation comes to you from the Father. And by the way, this has to do with our evangelism too. And James will talk about it in James chapter three, the servant of, and, and, and Paul will too, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Remember that, 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 that we can't convert anybody. Every conversion is a direct revelation from the Father about the Son to the heart of the person who believes. God help us to see that we are cast on the Lord for 
everything. And so you see yourself as Peter and you say, thou art the son of the living God to a man who looked just like you, or just like me. And you looked at him on the outside and you, you couldn't see. You just, I mean, the, the, the astronomical wonder. And at that point, you're the son of the living God. The question is, where does the son of the living God belong? Well, he belongs in heaven, doesn't he? That's what John said. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then John goes on and tells us, and the word became flesh. <clears throat> oh, the wonder. What? The son of the living God? As a man on earth? What are you doing here? Why are you here? And that is critically important because if the church is going to be on earth what she is called and meant to be, then she's going to have to be here on earth doing what he was on earth doing. And what was he on earth doing? Well, now you read about it, don't you? From that time forth, verse 21, Jesus began to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That's what he came to earth to do. He came to earth to die. And he came to earth to die the first time. For who? For his enemies. For those who were alienated from God. For those who were condemned in order that he might prepare mankind for, for glory, for the other world, for the eternal world, you see. And you see what Peter's reaction to it is. It, 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 no, be it far from thee, Lord. This shall never happen to thee. I want to suggest to you that what Peter uh, is expressing to the Lord Jesus in his rebuke to the Lord, where the Lord turns to him and says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou an offense to me. You can read about that spirit later in the book of the Revelation. And that spirit later in the book of the Revelation is going to mass manifest itself in what? That harlot, that whore, the mother of all whores and of all false religion. And that harlot and whore, which is a woman in the book of the Revelation, is put there to contrast her, the adulterous and unfaithful one who seeks to reign now. And she is presented in the book of the Revelation over against the bride that hath made herself ready and has made, yes, sir? That well, uh, uh, it's Babylon is what it is. Now, is the spirit of Jezebel there? Yes, absolutely. But it's bigger than that. And it, it's a contrast of, again, the Lord's bride. We're the Lord's bride. We're being made ready now. We're being prepared now to reign. But when does the faithful bride reign? Well, not now. And that's what was Peter was rebuking him for. Lord, that shall never happen to you. You're the son of the living God. The son of the living God on planet Earth must be here to reign. That spirit is contrary to the heart of Christ, to the mind of God. And it is what fills that future phenomena of that counterfeit bride. That is a whore, the mother of all false religions that seeks to establish itself and reign here and now. And so at that moment, you'll notice that when the Lord rebukes Peter, um, um, he says, verse 25, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now. Just like he did. He didn't come to reign. He came himself to 
carry his own cross and be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. For whosoever will save his life, what life? Well, your life now here on this earth will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life, what life? Well, his life now here on earth, for my sake, shall find it. Find it where? And now you come into the Colossians epistle. You are dead. And your life is hid with Christ where? In God. It's, it's, it's the life of glory. It's the life of the eternal world. It's the life that comes from that revelation from the Father to the heart that Jesus is the son of the, what, what God? The living God. Well, the, what's the point? The point then is, how are you ever going to be able on earth now, on this planet, to lose your life if it's the only one you have? How are you going to do it? I mean, if you're going to give up your life now, it's because the other life, is real, you see. It isn't just fairy tale. It isn't just pie in the sky wishful thinking. It's real. Oh, thank God for it. And so if the church <laughs> left here on earth is going to walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus that he himself left us to walk in, then the church has to be absolutely certain of the reality of the eternal world and eternal life. And that if you lose your life here and now, well, who else before we were called to lose our life here and now gave up his life here and now? The Lord Jesus. He would go to Jerusalem and he would go to Jerusalem and with his life here and now, he would go there and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again, never to die the third day. That life and that world has to become real to the church. And the history shows that whenever the church loses the sense of the glory and the reality of the living risen Christ and her union with him, the church resorts back to the material, the means, the stained glass, the crucifixes, you see, the, the even, even to some degree, the entertainment, all the natural thing, trying to fill that void, okay? that is left in her experience because she has lost sense of her union and contact with eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. And you get that picture in John 20 with Mary Magdalene. And I wish I could go there because it's vivid. And Mary Magdalene, when she comes to the tomb, she came with, 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 spices and she came with things to to somehow make a shrine of the tomb it was the closest thing she could do to to feel the lord jesus who was dead in her mind and because he was dead and she had lost contact with him she felt herself separated from him. She came to that tomb because that's where the body was. Just like people go to the tombs of their parents or their grandparents or their spouses who have died and, and they weep at that tomb because it's the closest you can get to them somehow. A, a, a feeling of nearness because of the separation of death. And Mary goes there with that kind of an attitude. And, 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 and you remember that she wouldn't leave the tomb. And how God uses the unique makeup of a woman to express this, you see. And Mary won't leave the tomb. And she can't leave the tomb. And she wants the Lord. And where have they laid him? His body's not in the tomb. Now what am I going to do? And the Lord speaks to her heart. 
Mary. And she knew living union with Christ. Oh, the wonder of it. <laughs> and not only living union with him in glory, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. And what was Mary's initial reaction when she knew it was the Lord? Remember? She went to grab him. Hold him. And the Lord said to her, uh-uh. That's not how you live now. Okay. It's not by the means and the physical and the sensual and the earthly, you see. No, don't touch me not. You can't hold on to me. I ascend to my father and your father. To my God and your God. And when she entered into the wonder of her eternal life, in union with the risen Christ, what she do? She left the tomb. And she went on proclaiming he risen as he had commanded her to do. History shows that when the church loses it, it resorts back to the shrine, the physical, the felt, the sensual, the emotional. God spare us from it. What is then absolutely necessary for the church on earth to be on earth like the Lord Jesus was while he was here on earth? The reality of who he is, his resurrection, his eternal life, alive to the Father, never to die again in our union with him. And that's the context then of the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And you'll notice that it says, <laughs> um, for whosoever will save his life, for my sake here now shall find it. What is it that enables us to lose our life here and now? In that sense, the only life we've ever had before, but now we've got a new one. See? What allows us to lose our life here and now is the reality that we have a new one. A new one we can live for here and now already. And we live for it here and now already. And as if we've heard Peter again, add to your faith, add to your faith, add to your faith. Because the more you add to your faith and to your eternal life here and now, the greater will be the abundance of the riches of your entrance when you enter into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the second coming of Jesus Christ in great power and glory is absolutely critical for the church's health and right living and function here on earth. Now, we come then into uh, uh, chapter 17, and it's, well, verse 28, chapter 16. So um, he says, Verse six, let's go to verse 26. So what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then he goes, for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels. And then, then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily, I say unto you, there be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see. See what? This is important. They see the Son of Man, what? Coming in his kingdom. And so they're brought up to the mount. And uh, as they're brought up to the mount, uh, you have Moses and Elias, El El Elijah. And I would suggest to you that these two men represent the two greatest sacrifices of the Old Testament. Passover and Elijah's great sacrifice at Carmel, where the fire came down from heaven. And the fire came down from heaven and didn't fall on the guilty. It fell on the sacrifice so that the people's hearts could be turned to the living God. Okay, so uh, these are the two that appeared with him, and yet the emphasis is <laughs> compared to the one who's there on that mount 
and the one who will come down from that mount to offer his sacrifice. Those two pale in comparison and are not even, in that sense, worthy to be linked with him. In other words, uh, Peter, again, Peter, opens his mouth. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Glory and power. And if thou wilt, let us make here three booth tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And the father rebuked it, did he? And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And now the Lord Jesus will come down from that glory to do what? What he had said he was on earth to do. From that time forth. And notice that's a new teaching that has never been given by the Lord in Matthew's gospel. From that time forth began Jesus, who had just been declared to be the son of the living God, here on earth as a man. From that time forth, he began to show uh, what he must do. Now, at this juncture, uh, one question. You say that Mary, I go back to my language. Okay. They went to the tomb to shine with you. She went to the tomb like you, if, if you, I don't know, I've never been to my dad's tomb. Okay. I love my father great. The reason I've never been to my dad's tomb is I, personally, I don't need it. And the reason I don't need it is I believe my father's in glory. I believe he's alive. I believe he's in heaven. I don't need to go to the tomb to, to feel good about my dad. I, I just don't need it. I remember being a boy, my grandmother, when she came from Cuba, she had three children. And one of them, she had two sons and a daughter, my mother. Uh, and one of them died of leukemia when he was 18 years old. And her leaving Cuba was a very, very difficult thing to do because she was leaving her dead son behind in that tomb. And she had come here. And after she was here in America for several years, I remember that one day she had her place in, in the garage. That's where she had her sewing machine at my parents' house and so on. Washing machine. She did all the chores at work and then really helped my mom, blah, 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 blah. And I remember, I, you know, we loved our grandmother greatly. And I went out into the garage and she was crying. And when she was crying, I mean, it, it, it hurt me. What, 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 what's happened to you? Pero que te pasa? Pero you didn't, what, uh, well, little did I know that was the day of the anniversary of her son's death. He had died, I mean, 40 years before. Okay. And and and, and as she was crying, and she 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 wanted to be left alone. She, she didn't want me asking her any questions. And I see she was holding on to something. Guess what she was holding on to? a lock of his hair that she had cut off from him before he had been buried. She brought that with her to Cuba, the, 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 from Cuba. And, and that's all she had. Closest she, she had to feel some connection. I'm saying that the way that the spirit of God presents the John 20 resurrection from the dead with the two apostles who leave the tomb, but the woman doesn't. She couldn't leave, man. She wasn't satisfied until. Say that again. Here's what it says. Yeah. You talk about Mary Magdalene. Right? Sure. In chapter, uh, what that Mark? Is Mary Magdalene? Mary no, you have to go to John 20. Well, what does it show? Yeah, but John 20 is the, the, the passage that emphasizes what I, what I, I what I'm, yeah. Yeah. sure. Can we, can we leave this with a discussion later? Um, so that I can finish with what I'm doing? No, I don't think so. Why not? Because you said this. I know, but this is what the discussion is for, Henry. We have a group discussion at 1130 to discuss this in the group okay, discussion. Okay. So I can, you know, okay, you, you know what I'm saying? All right, so we can go there. All right, so then now back to uh, Peter and the transfiguration experience. When you quote Peter, and let's go there, please, for a moment in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter one, back to adding to your faith and so on and living like the Lord Jesus lived. You'll notice specifically what it is that he emphasizes at that mount. 
And he says that, I will repeatedly, verse 13, verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Verse 13, yea, I think it meets so long as I am in this body to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. And so, moreover, I will endeavor that after I've put up, off my body, my disease, to have these things always in remembrance in your thinking. This is how important this is for the church and the character of the church. For we have not followed cunningly devised favors when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ by were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now here it is. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What Peter is saying is that on that mount, at the son's willingness to go down the mount and offer the sacrifice at Calvary, before that, at that mount, the father promised the son that he would come again in great power and glory. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in great power and glory to fulfill all the Old Testament promises concerning the kingdom of heaven must be and needs be an absolute living reality in the knowledge of the church so that she can be distinct from Israel in her earthly character and calling here on earth and be functioning according to her heavenly calling not fall into politics, not fall into changing the world, not fall into fighting against enemies, not to take up arms, but to do what the Lord Jesus was here to do. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not. When he was threatened, he threatened not. But the church is on earth for the primary emphasis and mission of preparing human beings for the eternal world to come. Because unless they repent, believe, and know Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, they will perish forever. And so Peter says, here was Christ. And verse 18, this voice which came from heaven, we heard it, and we were with him in the holy mount. And we have also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto you do well that you take heed unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Old Testament is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the holy man. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, Christ in glory. All the problems of planet Earth are going to be solved. The politics of planet Earth are going to be solved. The problem of evil is going to be solved. And the one who's going to solve it, the one who's going to put it down, and the one who's going to set up the kingdom of heaven is not the church here and now. The church here and now prepares men for that coming. He's the one that's going to do it, and only him when he comes in great power and glory. And if the church loses distinction, and the sense of that wondrous reality, the church loses the focus of what her mission and calling is here now, presently on planet Earth. Now, with that, I just want to go to the book of the Revelation for a moment. And then back to Matthew 16 and your thinking. Notice again that the moment that the church is brought into existence, the first thing that the Lord Jesus does is basically to bring her into a living awareness of his resurrection and his coming again in that great power and glory. Right there at the beginning of the church. When you come to the book of the Revelation, and now you read in Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 3. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now, Verse 4, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written herein, 
for the time is at hand. The time is near. Now, what things? Well, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in great power and glory. Realize this, that the book of the Revelation, 80% of its content is still future. The church will never go through it. It'll never be part of the church's experience. It's going to happen after the church is raptured and out of here. And yet, all that material, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ coming in great power and glory. And what is going to happen on planet Earth immediately preceding that coming in great power and glory. All that information, which is still future, and yet we're not going to be here when it takes place, is written to, look at chapter 1, and now uh, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. In that coming, you see, who have not repented. And now go to verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the, what? Seven churches. Who is the book of the Revelation written to? The churches. You and me, here and now. It's written to the churches. Look at verse 19 and 20. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are. In other words, that's the seven churches that he saw, right? Ephesus and all the way down to Laodicea. Those are the things which are. And then the things which shall be hereafter, after the church is gone. So the book of the Revelation can be divided into two parts. Huh? The things which are, that's Revelation chapter 1 through 3, and the things which shall be hereafter. That is all written to the churches. Write it. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And now what do you have in chapter 2 and chapter 3? The Lord's letters to the seven churches. Once you get to chapter 4, it's future. Now chapter 4, and chapter 4 will tell you, look at verse 1. After this, after what? After the things which are. Now here's what's coming, future. But now you come to the end of the book of the Revelation. And you come to the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And uh, it says in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. When was that said for the first time? Chapter 1. Say, to the church. And as to hammer the nail down, verse 16. Jesus I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things, where? In the church. So you have the two bookends of the book of the Revelation, and the two bookends are the churches. The whole thing is written to the churches. Now you tie that in with Matthew 16, and the character of the Lord Jesus, what he was on earth to do, what the church is on earth to do. And in order to empower that, the Mount of Transfiguration, the vision, literally, of seeing that moment when the Lord Jesus Christ himself returns in great power and glory. The absolute, fundamental, from the beginning of the church to the last breath of the church, that she be consumed with the reality. Back to Psalm 110, 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until. And in that great until, the church that knows and sees, that's John 14, 15, 16. How is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? How, how is, and, and that's what we are. We live 
in the reality of the risen glorified Christ and the truth of his second coming for the salvation of Israel and the dealings of the problems on planet earth. In the meantime, our calling here is to walk in light of him in glory in the heavenly calling of the church. Absolutely powerfully important. I will give you one more scripture, two more actually. Luke 23. This is so fundamentally important. The transfiguration is mentioned four times. The first time, Matthew 17. There, it is said to be the vision of the return of Jesus Christ in power and glory. When you go to Luke, go to Luke chapter 9 for a moment. Uh, this is, again, important. You go to Luke chapter 9, and there, notice how the transfiguration is presented. And again, um, it's in the context of verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and scribes and priests and be slain and be raised the third day. And then you come down to verse 27, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see what? Amen. Till they see what? The kingdom. the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Remember what he said in Matthew 17, till they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. So in John 17, it was a vision of his second coming. But now in Luke, Luke presents it differently. There are some here which will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. When? Well, not in the future. But the kingdom of God now. This world we're in is not the only world, you know. Simultaneous with this world is the eternal world of the kingdom of God where God dwells. And the events of this world are being directed right now from the kingdom of God. The Christian church is to live on earth knowing she's in the kingdom of God. And she is to be governed and led by the kingly rule of God from heaven now while she's on earth. That's powerful. And then you look at Mark's uh, presentation of the transfiguration, and Mark's presentation of the transfiguration is very beautiful and powerful too. And let's look at what the emphasis there is on the transfiguration. And that's Mark chapter nine. Notice what it says. And uh, verse one, and he said unto them, verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. What's the emphasis? What is the present power of the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God in its power doing now? And they go up and verse three, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as that no launderer, no fuller on earth could white them. What is the power of the kingdom of God now? Taking sinners like you and me, dirty, filthy, unclean, defiled, guilty, and not only saving us and making us right with God, but transforming us. The word transform, metamorphosizing us. Second Corinthians chapter three, the new covenant. What is it doing? As we behold with open faces the glory of God, we are being what? Transformed into that image from glory to glory. What is the present power of the kingdom of God at work on planet Earth? Taking people like you and me, former enemies and rebels, and turning us into saints. And that power will not rest till every one of us when the Lord comes for us, find ourselves to be like him. Oh, what a glorious thing this is. Wonderful, isn't it? And so now we come to Luke 23, and now two last verses. How the Lord coming 
in his great power and glory and his knowing that he would one day come in great power and glory because the father promised him that tremendous glory, that tremendous power is what enabled him to lose his life. That was planning. And he says that, and you see it in chapter 23 of Luke. And it says that as he was going to the cross, verse 27, there followed him a great company of people and of women, now women again, and women which we wailed and lamented him. Oh, poor young man, look what's happening to him. Look, he's going to Jerusalem to be humiliated, to suffer many things, to be rejected by the elders and to be crucified. Oh, what a horrible thing. And he turns around, he says, verse 28, don't weep for me, daughters of Jerusalem. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. For behold, the days are coming into which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave milk. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, when the Son of God is on planet Earth for the saving of men's souls, what? Is going to be done at the end of the age. <laughs> and so now you come to Peter again. You come to Peter, and Peter will tell you something of what the Lord was thinking when he said that. You see, as they were doing this and leading him to the cross to be crucified. And Peter now, we're in First Peter um, chapter 2. And he goes on and he says, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscious to regard endure grief, suffering wrongful. Verse 21, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who as the women bewailed him, see, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but did what? Committed himself to him that judges righteously. He's coming again. And he that judges righteously on that mount promised him great power and glory. Not at his first coming, but at his second coming. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto truth, righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed, healed from that old way of living and thinking on this planet under satanic delusion and bondage of darkness. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in great power and glory, written to the churches, told by the Lord at the first revelation of the church, because it is absolutely indispensable for the church to not lose her identity and her calling and where her life is. Blessed be the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and we'll come back at 1040. Father, we're thankful for that glory that the disciples saw of old, and we see it by the eye of faith, because we see it in the face of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's beautiful to us, because he is done for us what no one else has ever done. He's loved us when we were unlovely, and he's brought us into this new life and given us exceedingly great and precious promises. We know he did at great cost. We know he had to suffer and die. We know he rose again in triumph, and we know he ascended and is coming again. Amen. We're thankful for this. We look for him even today, Father. We pray that we would not be ashamed of his coming, but that we'd be living in a way that pleases thee. Help us by thy spirit. Help our break and our fellowship. In the Lord Jesus' name we ask. Amen.